be part of this webinar today. My name is Beth Buchanan. I'm the regional fire ecologist for the southern region of the Forest Service. But more importantly today, I am the co-lead of the Southern Blue Ridge Fire Learning Network. I co-lead that with Margaret Booker of the Nature Conservancy in North Carolina. And we have asked Jean Laubert from our sister network in the central Appalachians to talk about the variability of prescribed burns across the Appalachians. Jean is a conservation scientist with the Nature Conservancy in Virginia, and he is part of the Allegheny Highlands program. He's been working, he and his um, uh, peers with the Nature Conservancy have been working with the George Washington and Jefferson National Forest for over 15 years and um, really looking forward to hearing this presentation. And John, I'll let you go ahead and get started and introduce the other folks that you've got in your webinar as the time is appropriate. Thanks so much. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thanks. Thanks for the introduction, Beth. Unfortunately, I'm a conservation scientist with a head cold today, um, so I'm going to really try not to um, to, to cough too much into your ear, um, but if you suddenly, uh, if I hit mute all of a sudden, it's it's um, it's because of that. I've got a Ricola standing by next to me. I think I'll be able to power through though, because um, I'm really excited about this topic and I appreciate everybody spending time um, to come and learn about what we've been up to. And in particular, you know, this is um, I I wanted this uh, webinar to be really kind of collaborative. And as such, I was able to find uh, three great burn bosses uh, across the Appalachians who um, were interested in, 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 in showcasing one of their one or two of their burn units to um, to really kind of help showcase this broader theme of um, uh, that I've been that I think we've all been aware of in the Appalachians is that um, our the, the prescribed burning that we're putting down on the ground creates a lot of heterogeneity and diversity and um, what I have tried to do, I and my co-authors have tried to do over the past couple of years with this research paper that you'll see here today is um, to really kind of quantify, systematize and quantify that variability across across many, many, many burn units in the Appalachians. So hence the title, Hot Burns, Cold Burns, Exploring the Variability of Prescribed Burn Effects Across the Appalachians. And um, I've got, so I've got three burn bosses. I'll introduce them as they come up in a, in a few minutes here. But to kick it off, uh, the goals of this webinar are really threefold. So I wanted to introduce a, a new quote-unquote method for assessing the impacts of prescribed burning. I'll show you why it's not new. Um, showcase the variability of fire effects among prescribed burn units. And then relate the observed fire severity to the prescription and the operations that are actually carried out. And that's where the burn bosses and the actual um, burn implementation discussion will, will, uh, will intersect. So the, I call it a new method, uh, but it's not really. You know, all we all we did in this research paper, my, myself, Melissa Thomas Van Gundy, who is a research um, researcher out of the Northern Forest Experiment Station, and Steve Croy, the recently retired GW Jeff forest ecologist. Um, what we did was uh, map canopy mortality simply by looking at leaf on imagery um, post burn in a in a in basically the entire um, burn, the modern burn program of the GW Jeff. So it's really nothing fancy. We looked at a bunch of photographs and mapped out uh, areas of canopy mortality. Um, so again, we'll get into more details about this, but this is one unit, what that looks like. And so that allows us to compare results among individual burns. We can find the hot burns and the cool burns and everything in between. And um, we can also put those overall results, the averages of all the burn units together, we can put those overall results in context with a new Forest Service plan, the GWs. Uh, even though all these burns happened over the last 15 years under old plans with old objectives, we can still put it in context of what they're achieving with a new GW plan. And so in the course of doing this, we saw an incredible amount of variability, like I said, in just the results even on the GW Jeff. And so that became the, 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 the seed for doing a presentation like this. So to get you familiar, to, to show you examples, you know, here's pre-burn imagery of the Fenwick Mines unit in, um, near Blacksburg, Virginia, pre-burn and post-burn. And clearly, it's, um, you know, this is, when I saw this, this made me think, yeah, I, c I can map this. Something clearly has gone on here that I can draw 
um, draw polygons around. To give that you know, idea some shape and form, I looked to the George Washington, the new, the, George, the new George Washington plan from 2014, and the the ecological ecological conditions that were in that plan. Um, very broadly, were early successional open canopy and closed canopy of different ages. But those three categories of early, open, and closed had definitions and thresholds for canopy cover, and that's exactly what you can look at um, when you're looking at aerial pho aerial photography. So, again, here are the definitions from the plan about canopy cover. Here's what they look like from the ground on average. So I was looking... So now, um, and excuse me, here's, here's uh, another, a lovely shot of, um, it's a burn unit on the left, outside a burn unit on the right, and we've basically got all three conditions in this one picture. Uh, the closed on the right, um, the early successional kind of in the foreground on the left there, and up behind that, open canopy woodlands, mostly pitch pine. Um, so now, with that kind of framework in mind, when I look at a whole burn unit like this, I can... Um, Categorize it into these three broad categories to give some shape to um, um, to the to the analysis and form to the analysis. So here's another example, more zoomed in. Um, this is the New Road Run burn unit, and this is a year after the first burn. And you can this is leaf on you know full summertime imagery. You're seeing um, you know fully leafed out mature trees there that look like little broccolis. And those smooth, dark areas with the, you know, the little stippling, those are areas that experienced high canopy mortality um, and are regenerating, but the mature trees were killed. And so I can turn that imagery into these categories. So, again, this was um, – well, I'll talk more about the results of those across the GWGF. That was just to get you familiar with the data product that you'll be seeing these individual burn bosses talk about on their specific units. We're all going to show, among other things, what the what these so-called canopy gaps or the canopy conditions are that resulted from their burn. So this is where, um, you know, I, I definitely wanted, uh, I can do a GIS, GIS exercise all day long, but, you know, is it real? Does it reflect real conditions? Does it reflect what the burn managers know, the people who actually burn the unit? Does it reflect what they know the reality to be of that unit? So that's where um, I was happy enough to find um, three gracious burn bosses to show off individual units of theirs. And so we'll move on to that this section of the uh, presentation, and um, we'll look at individual burn units, excuse me, and the first up will be Rob Klein, who is the fire ecologist with the Great Smoky Mountains National Park. And Rob, I will turn it over to you. Here's your first slide. Okay. Hey. Good. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, you know, I, I, just to clarify, I'm not the I'm not a burn boss. Uh, I'm just a fire ecologist uh, here at the Smokies. But uh, but I was on this burn, and I and uh, so I have I have some pretty good knowledge of of what happened out here. And uh, I think what Jean is looking for uh, from from me is just to tell you a little bit about this burn unit and how it was burned, and what we see on the ground out there. Um, so, and and John, if I'm you know as I'm talking here, feel free to kind of pepper me with questions if you if you see something specific that you know you want me to add. Sure, we'll so, do. Thanks. Okay. Yeah. So this the beard cane, and this is this burn unit is actually a classic. This goes back to 2008, uh, when John asked me to to come up with a a good representative burn unit. This is one that immediately popped in my mind because we had a, as you can see in the the picture here, we had a, a pretty good variability of of effects with this particular burn, and a pretty good amount of you know what I would call high severity to moderate severity uh, fire effects especially on the upper slope and, and ridge top of this particular unit. So, okay, yeah, so, uh, yeah, go, yeah, here we go. So this, just to kind of set the stage, this, this burn unit is in the western end of the Great Smoky Mountains National Park. Uh, ele highest elevation out here in this unit is about 2,200 acre, or 2,200 feet, and uh, it's dominated by low-elevation oak forest with a, f a fair amount of pine on the, the south and west-facing slopes and ridges. Those pines are, are really mostly Virginia pine and pitch pine. There's a little bit of shortleaf pine, and, and there's probably a little bit of Table Mountain pine out there, but, but not too much. 
Uh, these forests are, you know, about 80 to 100 years old at least. Probably some of them are uh, a little bit older than that. Um, and this, you know, we know we had some settlement in the valleys around this area, and some of this area was actually commercially logged right before the uh, Great Smoky Mountains was was created as a national park. So we have a mixed bag of disturbance out there, but oh, by and large, the, the forest stands are about 80 to 100 years old out there. And so this unit, this is one of the larger burns that we've done in the Great Smoky Mountains uh, National Park over the last 20 years or so. Uh, so about 1,800 acres. Uh, and, you know, this, is, uh, this was the first entry of fire into this particular unit with the long-term goal being to reintroduce a more frequent fire regime in an effort to restore uh, the oak and pine uh, system out there, particularly uh, specific objectives trying to, you know, open it, open it up over multiple burns to uh, encourage pine and oak regeneration and increase the, you know, the herbaceous flora uh, diversity and, and abundance. So now we're, we're kind of now we're looking at just the, the landscape, you know, the, the burn unit map. And let's see, what do we, what do we have here? This, uh, what you're looking at, um, right there is just some arrows showing kind of how the, how the unit was ignited. And probably one of the more important things is to say that this was, uh, this was one of the burns that we were fortunate enough to have uh, a helicopter to, to, to do the, uh, the ignition on this thing. So the arrow, I, I think if I remember correctly, on the day of the burn, those arrows were probably going the opposite direction, but, uh, but the idea is the same. And so the ignition was essentially about a, a quarter to a third of the way down the slope on the west face of each of these uh, long parallel ridges. And just kind of running parallel with, with the ridge top. And there were quite, the, you know, the ignition intensity was probably pretty, pretty fast uh, with, uh, you know, with spheres being dropped on the ground at, a, at a probably the maximum rate. And so what, what essentially was created was uh, a, a fairly intense strip head fire from about, a, again, from about a quarter or a third of the way down the slope. Uh, particularly on the the longer ridge uh, that's called uh, Beard Cane Mountain, that's in, on the western part of this picture. Um, so um, that's that's kind of how it was burned. What I think probably maybe what we were looking for is something more like a ridge top ignition uh, at the time, but just um, that that's what we that's what we ended up getting, uh, you know, on the on burn day. Um, was a little, hey, bit, Rob, a little bit more intensity. Yeah. Is that uh, fire, is the weather on the day of burn, is that typical? Is that in the center of your prescription, at the edge? Yeah, that's probably real. That, that's probably right about in the middle, I would say, of, of what we what we see and what our prescription is. Um, 80 degrees on the day of the burn, RH around 35, KBDI 78, which uh, you know, the, the key thing here is that this burn was done in, in fairly late April, I think April 24th, uh, 2008, with a pretty, pretty mild west wind. So those conditions are, are kind of right, right in the middle, right square in the middle of, of what our prescription is. And, I mean, I, uh, it, you know, kind of ideal burn day conditions, I would say, uh, for that. Okay. But, but a li that's a little bit later into that, you know, that early growing season, I would say. Um, so things were starting, definitely starting to green up out there. So, kind of looking at a blank screen here. So what? Um, you sh so I'm seeing the next slides with uh, aerial photography. Are other people seeing that? There we go. It just popped up. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So this this shows your your product there. Um, oh, yeah. there. Okay. Okay. Okay, so you can kind of see that that effect uh, on the ridge tops of of these units here, and uh, you know, pretty pretty uniform, uh, you know, high severity at the again at the upper slope and top of the ridge. Um, fair bit of can canopy mortality. We do have some uh, long term monitoring plots out here that, uh, and I think we'll look at some pictures from those in just a second. Um, and I, you know, I think. You know the the vast majority of the unit, the lower slopes, the mid slopes, uh, probably had a very low. Uh, most of that stuff did burn based on our uh, a reconnaissance of the unit, uh, but it burned in a in a fairly low intensity and low severity. Mostly backing fires, probably some backing and flanking fires. Uh, not a lot of mortality except for what you see on the ridge tops out there. 
Um, and so, I mean, and that, that's just a direct consequence of, of the way it was ignited. Um, we did not do uh, black lining around the majority of this unit. We, we were really uh, fortunate to be able to rely on uh, trail, existing trails and, na and natural boundaries like streams. The entire western edge of the unit is a, is a long trail system that has a, a stream running right beside it. So we really didn't have to black line that. The northern and eastern sides of this are really bounded by significant, you know, wet water drainages uh, where we were just able to let fire back down and, and go out. Um, we did do some black lining on the southern end, which is uh, where we have a little bit more upper slope and mid slope, uh, you know, line there that follows a, a, a different trail system. So. I think that that probably contributes to the you know the the lack of severity and the lower slopes and things like that. Just the fact that we weren't doing a lot of uh, black lining around the majority of that unit. Gotcha. I'll so, jump in yep. and just talk about the canopy gaps real you quick. Bet. If y'all are seeing that on the screen, um, so of this 1,800 acre unit, 60 acres of it in red there became early successional, so less than 30% canopy cover. Um, that's about 3% of the unit. 80 acres of the unit became open canopy woodlands. That's about 5% of the unit. And the average size of the gaps, this is often an issue we get asked by wildlife folks or um, old growth folks, you know, what is a gap? And in this case, the, the gaps, quote unquote, are from two to 20 acres in size. There are probably, you know, single, there are certainly single tree, couple of tree mortality spots um, that just we don't count because that's just too small in terms of the scale. Um, so in context with the overall data set that I mentioned before across the whole GW, Jeff, at least, that we've got, these results are about average. So, you know, 8% of the unit became an earlier open, early canopy or open successional um, patch, and that's about average. And we'll go into more details about what that data set looks like. But just for context, this is about average across the region. Back to you, Rob. Okay. Yeah, and uh, and I and I think that's a good point. And so when you when you look at those numbers, it, th those percentages aren't very high for what we're calling early successional or open woodland. Um, but I think that the way that that we look at that here is that that's that's actually maybe uh, quite a lot uh, given the way that it is concentrated within that ridge top you know uh, system. So we're, we've really concentrated those effects on. What what are really are the target communities, which are the upper slope pine and oak, but what we have found in you know from our long term monitoring in the Smokies is that um, when you open up that canopy, if you do that early on in the in the prescribe you know in the fire regime restoration process, what you what you tend to do is to is to really just release the the sprouting hardwoods that are that are already present in the understory. So you can see we had um, the. The, in the lower left photo on this on this slide, you can really see that we had a really dramatic impact on the white pine that was in the the understory and midstory, uh, which is a that's a really desirable effect uh, out there for us. But if you go to and that was just that photo was taken just a couple of months after the after the burn. If you kind of clock around and come to the upper right photo, you see what it looks like a, a year and a half after the burn, and you can really see uh, you know a lot of the hardwood um, species that were that were in there with that white pine, things like maple, sourwood, black gum, uh, starting to kind of sprout back and re reestablish themselves in that in that understory. In a case like this, where you have uh, effectively, uh, you know, removed a certain portion of that overstory, where it, whether it be oak or, uh, in some cases, Virginia pine, uh, you know, you're, you're allowing a lot of additional light in, and, and those species that are in that understory tend to just grow a lot quicker. So that's, you know, it, it, we are looking to open up these stands. Uh, here with these burns, but what we have found is that it, it, the timing of that is kind of a critical thing. And so, well, again, while these numbers, these percentages on the landscape don't look don't look really high, you can see how they were concentrated uh, along that you know that one particular uh, part of the system, that ridge top you know, ecosystem there. And so, you know, it, it's it's something that we that we're looking at, and we probably ideally we would like to have a lower percentage on that first entry burn, and maybe even on a second entry burn until we start to see uh, more um, oak regeneration in the uh, you know in our understory, and then we then we want to look to to try to open up that canopy a little bit. 
So that's kind Great. of the story of of what what we've what we've seen out there and kind of how this relates. And I and I just want to you know reiterate some you know what I've said to Jean that this this is a super helpful tool. You know, it's really hard to get out to these places to see this, but this gives us a way to kind of look at the entire landscape. And uh, so you know, fantastic. Um, and I appreciate being a part of the discussion. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so happy to talk about uh, – I can take one question about Rob's unit right now, and then we can open up for questions overall after we go through the whole section. But does anybody have a, a question specifically about this burn unit or uh, any of the things that Rob described or laid out? Okay, we will move on to the next. So Jay Collette is the uh, assistant FMO for the north zone of the George Washington National Forest. And uh, he's going to present two burns at different ends of the spectrum. The first will be the Hone Quarry burn unit. Jay, take it away. Okay, folks, uh, can you all hear me? Loud and clear. Okay. Uh, as you all mentioned, I'm, I'm not an ecologist. I'm, I'm a zone AFMO and a, and a burn boss. On this particular burn, I was not the burn boss. Uh, I believe uh, at that time, this was back before primary fire uh, kicked in, so I think it was the timber folks uh, was actually running this burn from the, dry, the old Dry River District. So similar to what we looked at before as far as the age of the stand, uh, Main, two main ridges on the original whole quarry burn. The timber was, as we all know, was, was cut off uh, years ago for the iron ore furnaces and, and other homesteading. Uh, there's no real timber management in this area, mainly just recreation. Uh, one thing I want to mention on this on whole quarry burn is this was the first entry in 1999. Since that entry, we've we've gone back four more times on this burn, but we've expanded it. Uh, the original burn was about 1,500 acres, and now when we burned this unit uh, last spring, uh, it's now about uh, 5,500 acres. So uh, the first burn, we started the test fire there at the very north. Uh, end of this thing, just uh, below the Inn and Mountain. Uh, that's where the test fire was started. They started black lining to the east, southeast, and also to the southwest, uh, coming back towards Briar Branch Gap. Uh, once we got some decent black off off the the Home Quarry Ridge Road, they put the ship up and uh, started doing some contouring to add some depth off that whole quarry ridge area. Uh, while they were doing that, they noticed that the, uh, the test fire had spotted out. So right there about where the arrow is, the cursor is, that they had a little spot on the test fire. So they set the helicopter down at that point and let the fire continue to back. So, after they caught the test fire, uh, they put the the ranger for the dry river at that time in the helicopter to go back up and start lighting. That's the red uh, arrow you see on the screen. And I'm not sure, it might have been a little further downhill, but uh, the conditions that day, I don't have good documentation on, on the weather for the day, but I do know that it was it was low RHs and it was pretty dry. Things were were picking up pretty good as far as the the peak. That previous I do want to mention the previous summer and fall of '98 was one of our busiest summer and falls that I can remember uh, in this area. Uh, at that time in my career, I did not think much about that. Uh, going from that busy summer fall into the spring. But again, at that point in my career, it wasn't my 
uh, job to remember that. But, so when the helicopter went back up, he lit way down down the ridge and created a lot of heat, which uh, basically just ran straight up the ridge and spotted across the Home Quarry Ridge Road. And then uh, from that point on, it was just trying to hold on to what we had. Uh, I guess one of the things uh, that was, I guess that got me kind of concerned throughout the bat was the amount of spots we were getting and how, how quickly they, they grew. There again, not real good weather taken on site at that time. But uh, got really hot, as you all can see on the on the slides. So I'll step in for a second and talk about the canopy gaps that we that we delineated. Um, so of this 1,500 acre unit, 540 acres became early successional. That's 40 percent of the unit. Um, 40 acres became open canopied. You know lesser severity slightly, and that's about 3% of the unit. I hesitate to call them gaps at this point, but the gaps, as we call them, range from two acres in size to 130 acres in size. And this, is, this um, unit is, eight, is, is atypical in the amount of early successional that was created, but also the lack of kind of topographic control, typically in, in many burn units that we might see later on, um, there's a very clear um, control from controlled by the topographic features. So you'll see a gap in a dry ridge top, then you'll hit a creek, there'll be no gap. A uh, gap in a, in a dry ridge top, no gap. In this one, you can see in multiple cases that there's an early successional gap on ridge top in, in creek bottom, ridge top, creek bottom, on all these spur ridges. Um, so, Jay, does that, that sense of just kind of undulating, unbroken early, does that resonate with what you've seen in that unit? Yes, it does. Yep. So, like we've both been hey, describing John. a pretty high thing. Yeah. Hey, John. Hey, Jay. This is Steve. Um, yeah, I remember this burn well. I guess if you don't mind me jumping in, I was actually the PSD operator in the helicopter. Um, and what I remember that was unique is like Jay said that you had, they had the spot at the test fire location. The helicopter sat down for quite a while and the fire backed under a very dense stand of uh, mountain fetter bush, Purus floribunda, that um, sort of backed all the way off the ridge most of the day. Then when the helicopter did go back up, um, probably towards the end of the day, one of the last lines of um, ignition that was done was towards the creek bottom there um, at the base of most of the red area. And that uh, fetter bush stand had underburned just about all day. So what happened, it got enough heat and then it ran basically as a, as a shrub crown fire back to the top of the ridge and spotted over. Oh, wow. Yeah, Jay, do you remember some of that going on? Yeah, I, I couldn't tell exactly uh, where the ship was. I knew late in the day that last run they made, that's when we got all the all the heat in the spot. Right. I remember that the guy that was up front was, well, you know, we need to get this finished. Let's just do a, a line down here at the bottom and we'll finish it off. So. Uh, yeah, I think it might have bit off a little too much at once, but but it was that under underburning in that um, very dense um, evergreen shrubs layer um, that then reburned. Um, so that was that was interesting. Great. No, thanks for that perspective, Steve. Jay, real quick, um, in terms of structure, I think we can tell that there's a lot of early successional, you know, canopy mortality. Um, what has grown back? Uh, is your is your sense that it's a lot of tree regeneration, a lot of shrubs, some of both? Yes, we got we got really good regeneration in, in this whole unit. We it's been treated uh, four times since that burn, and we have uh, monitoring plots 
uh, in this unit now. They they weren't put in uh, on this entry, but uh, a lot of really good uh, uh, oak regeneration, uh, a lot of uh, openings, uh, browse wildlife, uh, unbelievable amount of of wildlife in this area now, talking to the local hunters and stuff. So from a from a burn that kind of went not as planned to where it's at now, as far as I'm concerned, it's, a, it's a definitely a a good burn unit for us. Uh, we've expanded it, like I said, now it's uh, 5,600 acres, and I think uh, doing a lot of good out there. Gotcha. Well, thank you. We uh, I think we could talk a lot about, and we, we can certainly entertain more questions about this one, but let's move on to the next one of your burn units, which is Elkhorn. Okay, so Elkhorn, this was burned the first entry in 2005. Uh, it's basically a standalone uh, mountain. Um, the, the the type and the and the age of this is the same as Old Quarry, about you know 100 years or so. Um, there was a there's there's no real timber management in the area. Uh, if you look on that slide there, that uh, southwest corner on the map, that is a white pine stand that we we have kept. You know, fire out of. But uh, it stands really good as a burn unit um, with the lakes and the road around it. This burn, uh, what we do, we hike folks up to the top of the mountain and then we split off and we run lighters down the ridges. And I think we had close to 20 some lighters. Uh, that we that we take off the top of the mountain. Uh, it's it hasn't. I don't know if I'm jumping ahead of myself or not, John. Just t tell me about the weather, just basically before we get into the effects. Okay. Or just the overall, you know, conditions. On that first burn, uh, it was a cooler day, uh, a little bit of cloud cover, uh, early spring. The north side of this burn unit still had, as you're driving in from the office, you're coming in from the north, and in that north face, there were still some snow patches hanging around on that north side. So it was a cool day. And the objectives for this unit were, were what? How would you describe them? Uh, back, back then, we were looking at more of a, a hazardous fuel burn. Uh, try to get some, you know, some nutrients back into the soil and uh, create some, some new growth for wildlife benefit. Uh, not really any any canopy gap openings in that first entry. Gotcha. So the the unit itself on that on that first entry. Uh, you'll see some of the what John has uh, to show as far as canopy gaps. It didn't create much of uh, any openings, really. Did a pretty good uh, job on some of the mid-story stuff on the south side of the burn unit. So here's, uh, hopefully this is popping up, uh, here's... Um, aerial photograph of the burn unit, maybe one year after the burn, I think. And in contrast to Hong Quarry, where we saw lots of, you know, um, canopy mortality, we saw lots of this brighter green, you know, understory, uh, sprouting mountain laurel, et cetera, underneath that mortality, we hardly see any of that here. In fact, um, basically less than 1% of this burn unit became an earlier and open gap. And you can see there's three little uh, gaps there, mostly on that southern, southwestern aspect. Um, again, the gaps around two acres in size. 
So in terms of the overall GW Jeff data set, this is one of the obviously one of the cooler burn units. It's not uncommon. I mean, there's several burn units after their first burn that had very minimal canopy gaps. And as you heard Jay talk about, you know, this was not designed to be a high intensity burn at all. Back to you, Jay. So, like John said, it, the first for the first entry, uh, we met our objectives. Uh, as we've gone into more entries here. I think our last one was 17. This unit still uh, is in need of some more some more heat. Uh, so my plan uh, moving forward, and if I can get my hands on the helicopter, would be try to do some contouring to try to build some more heat on some of those uh, southwest ridges. Uh, if we can't get the ship, we have. I've got a map I've worked on on which ridges I like to see uh, burned a little hotter, and I think in order to do that, we'll need to do some contouring instead of just running folks off the off the ridges. But uh, we're looking at running this unit again uh, late this summer. Uh, that's our plan for for this unit. Yeah, and that's one of the few kind of you know late summer, early fall burns that we've done recently so we're looking forward to seeing to, to monitoring the effects of that and there's a lot of good you know especially at the southern blue ridge fln meeting a couple of weeks ago um the, the the idea of burning late growing season you know august september has you know has, has resurfaced or has has always been there and here's a great chance that jay is taking to to execute that on this burn unit so looking forward to that thanks a lot jay um we are going, we'll take more questions, uh, obviously, about any of these burn units again after we're done. So right now we're going to move on to our almost last burn unit, which is the Big Wilson Central unit in uh, Bath County. That's in the central zone of the George Washington National Forest. It's a big one. This portion of it, at least, is 2,900 acres. So I'll turn it over to John Moncure, who is the forestry and fuels technician for the central zone of the GW. Thanks, John. So, hello, everybody. Um, I, like you said, I'm the fuels technician on the central zone here where this burn occurred. And that day I was the burn boss trainee, so literally in the hot seat for this one. Um, this burn is a, is a subunit of a larger unit. Um, we called it the central unit, so it was about 3,000 acres, and there was a unit to the north of it and a unit to the south of it. Um, and we had already burnt the northern unit uh, a couple weeks prior to this one with different weather conditions and different ignition pattern. Uh, we burnt the central unit in, I think it was early April of 2012. And then the southern unit we didn't burn until 2014, so a couple years before the last one. Um, the weather predicted for that day was uh, everything in the was within our prescription parameters with the exception of the relative humidity that was predicted to be in the mid to upper 20s. So that requires us to get a variance from the region. And with everything else being within the prescription parameters, uh, we we were granted the variance and we decided to go ahead with the burn. Um, the actual humidities on site that day, I think the minimum was 18% or it might have been 17. I'm looking at my paper. Yeah, it was 17%, which is pretty low. Um, but that was the actual minimum. So we were dealing with pretty dry conditions uh, to get this one done. Um, we utilized aerial ignition. Uh, we didn't do any black lining prior, so we were doing all this in, in a shift. Uh, so a lot of fire in a short amount of time. And uh, I think you'll be able to see, maybe we can get to the next slide. Um, I can touch on our objectives real quick. Um, in the, most of the objectives kind of fell underneath the habitat restoration. Um, we were looking at promoting more age class diversity. So we, we were looking for early successional. We were, we were looking for um, mid to late successional, and, and we wanted to maintain or promote some um, open canopy um, late successional habitat as well. And another objective was uh, Restoration recruitment for oak and yellow pine regeneration. Uh, you know, the mass producing trees, oak and hickory, we want to promote uh, more regeneration for them and, and the native pines as well. So those were the, the major objectives for us, habitat related. 
Uh, so the hey. air ignition – yeah, go ahead. No, that's it. You're hitting it. Okay. Uh, air ignition uh, that day, we're focusing on lighting the higher ground. So we're talking ridge tops and secondary ridges kind of running uh, towards the bottom of the mountain. And you can see in the map, there's, there's plenty of them. So there are a lot of ridges to run. Um, and that was the main focus where – and then the hand ignition was happening along the top and the flanks, uh, trying to get ahead of the ignition, the air ignition. I think and that we'll – Go ahead. You know, you go ahead. That ignition pattern of hitting both sides of the spur ridge, I think, was not something that was norm typically done, correct? Yeah, right. And with this particular unit, um, you can see on the kind of northeastern flank, there's a creek, okay, and that was very tough terrain, and we had burned the area north of it, <clears throat> so we had no, no operations uh, along that northern flank. It was mainly the top, where you see the airport running north and southward, and then... Uh, we brought fire a little ways into that drain where it gets really steep on the south end. And at that point, it was uh, too steep for people and it was wet. So that was kind of like we just let it go in there. So the, the main hand ignition was basically along the top um, and then along the bottom where the road was. And we can look at, um, yeah, here you go. There's some smoke activity there. <clears throat> Um, this burn, I guess you could say, is considered a, a little bit on the higher intensity side for results. Uh, as you can see, a lot of those ridges um, saw some good activity. Uh, I, I contribute that first and foremost to the weather. That humidity was really low, uh, and so that's you know no matter what you, you're lighting, it's, it's going to have increased activity with that kind of low humidity. Um, and the other major factor is was using the aerial ignition, which I'm certainly not detracting the use of air ignition. It's an incredibly u useful tool for us. But um, what you get a lot, and this is personal observations more than anything, is anytime you use air ignition, um, you're putting a lot of fire down on a lot of ground in a short amount of time. So you're going to get a lot of fire effects, and you're going to get some intensities. Um, like, when, you know, what, what it takes a helicopter to fly one ridge is a matter of seconds to minutes where you take somebody uh, on the ground doing hand ignition and it could take well over an hour or more to walk down a ridge doing ignition. So the time frame is a lot longer uh, for hand ignition than it is with aerial. So things happen quick. Um, and of course, we didn't do any black lining, but this unit didn't really lean itself to that because of the terrain. Um, but I think in instances where you do use black lining, you do lower the complexity and uh, Kind of lend yourself to have a safer, safer burn window. But you can gotcha. see the results here. Um, early successional was a, quite a bit more, I think, than what we were uh, shooting for in the objectives. Uh, and the open canopy in the green, that, that looks pretty good. Yeah, so in terms of, uh, you know, so seven, over 700 acres of early successional forest, 24% um, of the unit, 250 acres of open canopy woodlands, 9% of the unit, gaps as big as 150 acres. Um, you know, there's still some topographic control here. You see that pattern of alternating bands of, um, of early successional uh, closed canopy, early successional closed canopy, again, with those northern slopes and, and creek bottoms uh, not experiencing um, high severity. So in terms yeah. of the overall data set, again, this, has, this is on the, on, on the upper end of the amount of um, on the upper end of, of all the units in terms of how much uh, early successional was created. It's also on the upper end of how much open canopy woodlands was created. So lots of lots of uh, good effects inside. Hey, uh, John and John. Yeah. Uh, this is Sam Lindblom. Hey, can I throw a little bit in there too, John? Please. Please do. Uh, I, I was the firing boss in the helicopter and, and one of the things I recall doing, our helibase was literally right there in the, in the photo. In the, Airport, and we were um, we learned a lot from that. Uh, when you have so much line to ignite on the ground before you can fly, um, I don't have my records in front of me, but I don't think we got up in the air, John. Correct me if I'm wrong. Till 1:30, almost 1:45, something like that in the afternoon. Yeah, uh, you, you had to wait for us to get well underway, and that that's what did it. And we and so we weren't able. So and then we had a lot of worries from the. Ranger, and these are legitimate worries um, about smoke management in Clifton Forge, which was a down drainage 
And so he encouraged us to, you know, let's let's get this thing going so we can get the smoke up. So that's what we did. So, you know, it is one of those tough situations and, and I think Jay can relate to this and particularly with Home Quarry when you're when you shove your aerial ignition into an extremely short period of time, that invariably is at somewhere between two and four o'clock in the afternoon. And uh, and when you already have a dry day, it just makes it just makes moderating the fire intensity from the helicopter a, an essentially impossible task. <clears throat> and uh, so one of the things I learned from that was we got to design our burn units in such a way that we can fly whenever we need to, not 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 have to wait on some, you know, impossible, you know, 10 miles of hand ignition before we can fly the helicopter. That was my take home from that, that unit. Um, anyway. Well, and you've incorporated, you, we've incorporated that into our, uh, into our plan since then, right? I mean, we, we've that, you know, black lining the day before combined with, uh, you know, earlier air, it enables earlier aerial ignition, like you guys have implemented yeah, that well, lesson learned. It, it enables you to have the choice. Um, John, as the burn boss, didn't have a choice all of a sudden, you know. Yeah, and, and that can speak to, to to the future on this is, is you know, that was this was the first entry, all these units in here, um, and it's going to be up soon again to, for rotation, and we are certainly talking about learning from – you know what we did differently, what we what we can do differently next time, and it will include uh, a lot of black line, <laughs> and uh, that's going to help enable us to have more time and more control over the rest of the ignitions as as the as the windows allow. You know, and whatever how many windows it takes is whatever it takes. It, that's not the issue anymore for us. Um, and if and if you had slides of the unit north of it um, that we burnt two weeks prior, that was all hand ignition. Uh, with a cooler day, the RHs didn't get down to like the low 40s, so they never even broke into the 30s. And there's there's very little canopy gap uh, on that north unit. And then the unit to the south uh, was pretty good prescription. Again, air ignition, black lining. We did a little bit of black lining prior, but most of it was that day. And it too was had a little bit higher intensity than than uh, the north the north unit. But it's it's a lot similar to the central yeah. unit. Awesome. Well, thanks for the the, the context and the uh, you know, how you have you how you've incorporated the uh, the lessons into and in subsequent burns. Um, I want to move on and get to that. Really, was our last burn. In essence, we've got one unit in Pennsylvania that we've shelved for a couple of reasons. But there's one cool thing I want to show you about this. After I show you this, I'll open it up to the to the audience. We can uh, any other questions about any of these units. And then I'll conclude with the last shorter part of the presentation, which is just about the data set, the results of the analysis when we looked at a whole bunch of burns across the GW Jeff. So um, here's real quickly. This is uh, Pennsylvania Game Commission land. And what's cool about this is that this is actual imagery from drones. So it's really high resolution, um, uh, you know, low, low altitude, obviously, um, drone flights that collected this super, super high uh, resolution. I'll show you the the results of that, but first, I do have to warn you that it is, it is extremely high resolution, so, um, you know, just be careful. Okay. Sorry, I had to throw in a Wayne's World reference when I could. Okay, so here's what that <laughs> high resolution gets us. No, no Wayne's World quotes, though. We can't, we can't derail ourselves. So here's typically, you know, what we're looking at, 1 to 7,000. You know, I look at, I delineated the canopy gaps at about this scale, a little closer. You're looking at 400 acres in green on the screen here. Um, you can do stand-level mapping. You know, you could draw polygons around those areas of canopy mortality pretty easily. Um, but next, so we're going to zoom into that red square, or that red rectangle next. So now, wow, here we are. We're at a scale of 1 to 750. So you can see, you know, 100 feet is a good section uh, of the screen. So we're looking at seven acres on the screen now. Now you're clearly able to see individual tree canopies, especially right at the edge where you see a dead tree next to a live tree, and you can pick out individual trees. Um, you know, that's something we cannot do with normal uh, NAIP imagery, and certainly the color differences. I don't think there's anything multispectral going on. This isn't quite real color, I'm sure. Um, this, so there's some sort of spectral shift going on here. But anyway, you could pick out uh, 
uh, individual trees, either by color or certainly by by shape, and certainly dead or alive. Um, so now, but wait, there's more. We're going to zoom into this yellow slide. So now we're at 1 to 150 scale. This whole screen is is a quarter of an acre. And so now we're, you know, we can look at individual tree branches. N not that we need to, um, but what's interesting, what you could conceive of if you had this data, is you can start to map crown, you can uh, measure crown diameters of individual live and dead trees. And there are known relationships between crown size and tree diameter, so all of a sudden I could probably, you know, with this sort of imagery, I could create a histogram of, you know, tree canopy of, of, of tree crown sizes that were live and dead and look at and essentially make an informed guess about the DBH of trees that were live or dead. Um, so, um, you know, and obviously that's stuff, that's information that can be gathered with, you know, on the ground monitoring, but this is a, would be a lovely supplement to that. So uh, a different discussion for a different um, webinar, but I just wanted to highlight for you all the, uh, the, the drone imagery because we had it, and it's pretty cool. Um, so, okay, one of the, so we've gotten through some of the webinar goals. Here's another webinar goal. Showcase the variability of fire effects among the burn units. So again, this was what was in that research paper that Steve, Melissa, and I published, where we looked at basically the GWGF's modern burn program of over 120,000 acres, I think all told 75 different units. But uh, we looked at a bunch of units that have been burned once, twice, a few that have been burned three and four times. And um, so let's look at the variability within each entry, like all first burns. And then let's also look at the variability among entries. So let's look at first burns versus second burns, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then how do the, again, on the theme of variability, how does the average result and the extreme results compare to goals for structure um, that are in the new George Washington plan? So essentially comparing you know, that spatially mapped canopy gaps to the desired conditions for structure. Okay, so lots of lines here, so don't don't move your head left and right too much because you get dizzy. But each vertical line is an individual burn unit. So we're looking at 57 different burn units, and the y-axis is the percentage of that unit that after a, a single burn is early successional open canopy or closed canopy. Okay. And I've arranged them, you know, in order of, of severity, essentially. So the most extreme, the hottest burns are on the left, the coolest burns are on the right. So the average, the mathematical average, is 5% uh, of a burn unit becomes early and 5% becomes open. And that's represented with the, uh, the units that are in, the, in the, the yellow oval there. So again... Uh, cool burns are on the right side, hot burns are on the left side, and we range, the, whole, the, the gamut runs from, you know, essentially 100% of the burn unit remained closed canopied after a first burn, and that was kind of like Jay's Elkhorn unit, right? Now you can kind of picture what that looks like. All the way to on the hottest side, I believe this one right here with the 40% early and only 3% open, that's Hone Quarry. Okay, so now you can picture what that looks like. But obviously, the story here is there's a huge variation in between. So if you wanted more cool burns or if you wanted more hot burns, we can look at that. You know, I would encourage us to look at that subset of units that has those characteristics that you wanted and try and figure out what created that. And, you know, the stories that we've been hearing today, I think, are starting to tell that tale of, yeah, it's no surprise that this unit became, uh, you know, 40% open because of condition X, Y, and Z. Or it's no surprise that this unit didn't really have any noticeable canopy effects um, because of X, Y, and Z. So I, I heard commonalities from the different burn bosses, or from the different burn folks, um, about why the units turned out the way they did. So, it is, but again, to showcase the variety, here is units that have been burned three times. So not as many, um, but the, you know, so there's hot, average, and cool again. The average value for a unit that's been burned three times is that 16% of the unit becomes early and 9% becomes open. So again, you can burn three times and have relatively you know, intact closed canopy, or you can burn three times and have a lot more early and open. 
And um, depending on what you want, you can look to these other burn units as examples. So um, what drives that? I'm not going to get into this a lot. Happy to talk about it offline because that's what our next publication is about. But you know, there there is some method or there is some some patterns to what drives all this, as you would suspect. This one uh, index is called heat load index, and it's basically a measure of the annual solar radiation that hits each pixel. Okay, and it ranges from zero to a hundred, and it takes into account slope, aspect, and latitude. And what we found when we looked at all of our canopy gaps across all of our burn units that when you had a high heat load index value, um, early and open was created at five times the rate. Okay, so I've just been informed by my colleague that you guys are not maybe seeing what I'm seeing on my screen, which is a multi-hued uh, uh, diagram of heat load index across a burn unit. We've got it now. You got it now. Okay, sorry. I was probably going too fast. Um, do I need to backtrack on anything? Anything make sense now that you're seeing this slide? Okay. I think anyway, good. okay. So uh, th what I would call your attention to here is the fact, and again, this is no shock, but again, we quantified this over a large number of burn units, that these higher heat load index values, these hotter sites, have five times the rate of canopy gap formation as do the cooler sites. Um, and you can see that exemplified in this burn unit where almost all the canopy gaps, certainly on the western facing, southwestern facing slopes, but even on the, the, eastern, uh, the eastern half of the unit, um, where the canopy gap showed up was on these uh, hotter micro sites. So again, just an example of heat load index. And also what you'd expect is the ecological system um, drives canopy gap formation. So, again, this was on um, you know, units that had been burned once, um, and we've and, and so what this table is is um, acreage of each ecozone group or each ecosystem group, from xeric on the top to mesic on the bottom, and the percentage of early and and the percentage of that ecosystem acreage that became early and open gaps. And you can see the pattern here is that the most xeric, um, with the exception of barrens, but the most xeric, dry pine oak, had the highest levels of early and open as you move down the column, you know, compare dry pine oak early to um, cove early, 14%, 2%, right? So that's a predictable pattern. It's one you guys would expect, but it was nice to see that expressed in the data. So those are two Two of the drivers that, you know, obviously we'll throw into a model to try and figure out um, when and how these canopy gaps and the variability of the canopy gap formation. So, um, so we looked at the variability of first entry burns, but now let's look at the variability across multiple entries. So let's compare one burn units to two burn units to three burn units to four burn units. Um, so what we see here is a table of burn history and the percentage of that acreage in that burned history that became open and that became early. And the trend here is to look down the table, right? So, you know, with, with increasing amount of burning, do you see increasing amount of open and early? And overall, uh, the trend is that uh, units with more burns had the same percent open as units with less burns. There's a slight upward trend, but it wasn't statistically significant. For percent early, units with more burns had somewhat more early than units with less burns or fewer burns. So not much of a trend with open, something of a trend with early. Um, and one last comparison is, so that was a snapshot of all burns at the same time. But now we're going to follow, this is, this is a better um, analysis because the variability goes down because we're going to look at the exact same burn units after one burn event and after another, after the next burn event. Um, so um, less variability due to different sites. These are the same sites burned once versus burned twice in this top comparison. Um, and what we see, or, or um, so that, that's the top comparison, then there's two burns versus three burns, and then there's one burn versus three burns. We only have six of those, so it's not a great statistically. But again, when you look at these comparisons, the overall trend is that additional burns sometimes create more early, like we see here, it goes, it goes, the percent early goes from five to 10, but 
not more open. So in that same comparison, the percentage open from one burn to two burn stays at 5%. So again, sometimes early goes up, typically open does not. Um, so here, here's just one example of uh, the same unit that it was after it was burned once and after it was burned twice. This was one of, I, I said that, uh, I just said that, you know, subsequent burns don't create a lot more um, early and open. And here's, here's one of the better examples where you do see additional effects after that second burn. So we went from that burn unit after one to that after two burns. Open, go, open and green goes from 3% of the unit to 6%. Early goes from less than 1% of the unit to 5%. So you can change. Um, I, I don't know what the, you know, if there was a prescription change, but that would something um, would be interesting to look into from first to second. Um, real quickly, I think this is the last slide, that when we look at, about, oh yeah, please. Is there about time frame for that? Yes, so this is the Little Fork burn unit, and I've got it on a spreadsheet somewhere. Uh, I think it was several years. I think it was at least five years. Jay, can you back me up on that? Do you have that number off the top of your head? I think I can find it. Stand by. Yeah, I'd have to for a little fork uh, to find out the exact eight years. Yeah, eight years. It was 2000 and 2008. Okay. Switch. Okay. Uh, and then the last point, or any other questions? Last point was um, when we look at the desired conditions, for early and open in the GW plan. Um, the desired percentage for uh, early is 12 for oak systems. And what we see throughout all of these different um, burn units is that the average is around eight, so we're in the ballpark, and the range is obviously is, is a lot greater from zero to 54. So we can have extremes uh, and those, you know, quote unquote, overachieve early within that burn unit. Uh, but on average, we're in the ballpark for what we want for early. In terms of open canopy, whether it's mid or late successional, the av uh, what we want is actually 67% of the landscape. That's pretty high. Uh, the average is 8, and the range is 0 to 34. So again, we're not yet seeing open canopy woodlands at the rate that we'd like, but there are multiple different pathways that, you know, we, we, it could be that we're whittling down the basal area with each subsequent burn, even in areas that you might see as closed canopy today, we're slowly decreasing the basal area so that over time we'll all of a sudden, after, you know, third, fourth, fifth burn, we'll get a lot of uh, open canopy all of a sudden because that threshold has been reached. So I uh, just wanted to put, but, you know, overall broad brush, you know, we're achieving about the early that we want, but not quite the open successional, I mean, uh, open canopy woodlands. So I believe, besides saying thank you to everybody, uh, all the, the, the folks who contributed to this um, to the presentation and who were responsible for a lot of these photos. Um, I had a great time putting this together and working with y'all, and I will be happy to take any questions. I know we've gone over, but I'm, I'll stay as long as possible, but I wouldn't hold anybody else to that. So I'll take any questions. We will all take any questions. Do you see there's a question, follow-up question in the chat? Uh, I'm still looking at my PowerPoint, so I'm happy for okay. you. Could you read it to me? Again from Steve, for the time frame questions unit, any differences in burn day weather conditions? <laughs> Excuse me. Uh, Steve, go ahead and expound upon that question. Um, I think we heard, you know, burn day weather. We heard from Jay on Hone Quarry that it was pretty low humidity. We heard from John Moncure that. Um, Big Wilson Central was pretty low humidity. Both of those resulted in uh, higher severity, would be characterized as higher severity. Um, but, yes, yeah, so we have an anecdotes, I think, for that. Uh, 
in terms of the overall data set, you know, all 75 burn units that we looked at, we haven't yet got data for day of burn conditions, KBDI, et cetera. But we'll, we'll be taking a look at that in, in, as part of the model. Yeah, I'm not sure which Steve that was. It wasn't me. Oh, okay. I hear other bleeps and bloops, so just go ahead and chime in. Okay. Um, there's several, so I'll read them to you in the order they've appeared. Okay. From Travis, what unit size appears to be the upper limit for hand ignition operation? Oh, sorry. Time, time out. There's a reply from Steve. Was it drier the second burn day eight years later to account for the increase, increase in early? Good question. Do not know. That's something that we'll, we'll, once we get the data, we can start to put those pieces together. But, yeah, as of right now, I can just show you what happened. Can't tell you why. Jay, do you remember Little Fork's North Zone, right? Do you remember the 2000 and <laughs> 2008 Little Fork burns? As far as the exact weather, I do not. Uh, yeah. I can try to try to do some digging for that. Yeah, thanks. I mean, not necessarily right now, but, yeah, long term, that would be great. Okay. Now we'll pop back to what unit size appears to be the upper limit for hand ignition operation. That's from Travis. I will throw that to the, the folks that plan and execute burns, which is not me. Uh, for us in the Smokies, I can I can say from experience that the biggest thing I think we've done in a day uh, with hand ignition only is about 800 acres, and I don't I don't know if that's uh, a max or, or or anything else. It probably depends on the situation and the you know how much black lining is required and all that. But that's for a unit that did not have a lot of black lining required. So about 800 acres. We're wrapped up here in the. Virginia, <clears throat> five eight hundred acres is probably about the most we'd ever try to do. So I'd be curious to see what um, what Jay or John have to say about that, or other burn bosses that are on the, on the board. But it'd be it'd be hard to get on some of the terrain and vegetation we have. It'd be hard to get igniters down those hills. Any, any much yeah, I can. This this is John. I can chime in, and we did do one burn uh, that was just over a thousand acres with hand ignition. And it took a lot of people uh, to get everything lit. So it, it's a matter of, you know, complexity, terrain. I'm not saying it's impossible to do something larger, but it would take a lot of coordination. So, you know, the 1,000-acre threshold is, uh, if I had to pick a number, um, but you got to look at the complexity of the unit, how easy can you walk through it. Uh, is it all early successional? It's going to be hard to walk through. And, or is it open, you know, closed canopy kind of stuff? Um, but... Yeah, we we we've done a few uh, in the seven eight hundred acre that was okay, but the thousand acre one did take a lot of people and a lot of coordination. So <clears throat> that seems to be a magic number cut off for me. Well, this is Jay up on the north zone, and uh, due to the circumstances this spring, uh, we were able to burn cat back by hand. Uh, that's twenty seven hundred acres. It was quite the operational feat. I uh, wouldn't plan on doing that uh, again, but it took me four days to get that unit burned, breaking it up from a north to a south unit. Uh, but we have burned up here several burns by hand several times around the 1,200-acre uh, size. But uh, there again, it takes a lot of, a lot of folks, and our folks aren't getting any younger. Okay. Okay, we'll jump to the next question then, which is from Margaret. Do you have enough seasonal variability in burns to have any thoughts how much season may matter to create openings or keep early grassy rather than brushy? I think I'm right in saying that most of the burns in the GW in Jeff have been, you know, March, April, early May. So we haven't experimented a ton with, you know, August, September burns, you know, late season versus quote unquote dormant season or early growing season. Am I right, y'all, from the GW, Jeff? 
Yeah, you're uh, correct. This is, this is John. Um, we do have a couple burns uh, that are scheduled and to to be burned during growing season, which could be any time from now until early fall. Um, so we really haven't executed them yet, but they're in the plans. They're uh, on schedule. We're just waiting for the right conditions and windows. And I believe most of those, the two burns I'm thinking of, we do have uh, vegetative plots in, so we'll, they'll be heavily monitored to try to find out those answers because we are asking those questions for sure. I think one, this is Steve. I, I was just going to say it looks like there could be other variables going on uh, related to shrub and grass um, development, not necessarily season, but um, maybe related more to uh, to soils. So uh, typically the grassier uh, component that we see developing looks to be on more sandy soils uh, coming from a, a very rich uh, sandstone substrate. So anyway, that's something something to be looked at more. Yeah, that, that for us down here in in Tennessee and you know in the Carolinas, what we what we see is that it it really it, it seems like another uh, factor or variable that really comes into play is the site history and how much herbaceous material is existing on the site prior to your burn. Uh, for most of the things where where we have you know 70 to 100 plus year old forested stands, I think you know we we've, we've seen effects of prescribed burns throughout. You know, for, from you know, uh, late summer, fall, uh, spring, and we've also seen the effects of wildfires. You know, from from all the different seasons as well. And the re the most common response that we get, uh, you know, in answer to Margaret's question is just it, it's more of the woody regrowth coming back after a single burn, uh, unless that site has you know had had some kind of disturbance in the recent past where it had, where uh, more of a grassy or herbaceous component had been allowed to grow back in uh, and it was already pre-existing on the site. I, I think that's a much more likely thing. And I think that may be something that, that could differ between the southern apps and the central apps too. So I think there's some interesting work to be done there uh, looking at those differences. Just have a comment from Beth Buchanan. Um, get it in the record here. Pretty clear that we need to keep good records of weather conditions, ignition patterns, and so on, and correlate this information with any fuel vegetation data we are collecting. And then the next question is from Andrea. Were you surprised with any of the data? I think certainly the the level of variability, even after a single burn, um, yeah, w was surprising. You know, to go from uh, zero percent of a unit having a you know, or a hundred percent of a unit being closed canopy, or fifty percent of a unit becoming early successional, you know, that both of those outcomes are possible after a single prescribed burn. Um, yeah, that was a little surprising. But again, you know, the super extreme are the outliers, and it's not to say they're even bad. But um, yeah. That 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 level of variability was uh, was was uh, surprising. Okay. And the fact that subsequent burns, what was interesting, the fact that subsequent burns didn't necessarily create lots of increase in early and open. Also, that basically that that a site burned once, twice, three times kind of remained the same was also surprising. I'm not sure that it's not always the case like I showed a slide of, but on average a unit tends to stay the same. So that to me makes me think, is there do you change the prescription the second time or um you know, if you're not happy with, with what you got the first time. Okay. Uh, from Travis. For your growing season burns in forest habitats. What weather parameters are you looking for, ideally? Open to the floor. Uh, this is John. Um, I would say one thing was humidity related. Um, lower humidities, maybe not quite 20s and upper teens, but 
definitely in the low 30s, maybe upper 20s. Uh, we tried a uh, growing season burn last summer, um, and it was typical summertime humidities, and we couldn't get it to go hardly at all. I mean, and, and I, I can't remember exactly what humidities were that day, um, but I, I'm sure they weren't. They were higher than, than they need to be, obviously. So that's one parameter we'll need to focus on for the hot, humid days is, is lower humidities, which they're pretty rare <laughs> in this part John, of the John, were you talking about when we did uh, little um, mirror run, trying to do that? Yeah, absolutely, that one. Yeah, so I I think we need, if we're going to focus on summer burning um, up here, in, at least in Virginia, we need to go, we need to go look at the places that, that – um, that sustain wildfires in the summer, lightning ignited sustained wildfires. So I think we got to look on the on the south and western slopes. Um, Agreed. We got to look for places that are open and hadn't seen fire in a while. The problem with that mayor run unit that John was just referring to is that we had burned it just a few years prior, so it didn't have a lot of fuel, and it really didn't have the best aspect. Interestingly enough, the reason we chose to try that burn that day. It was something that we needed to complete from a black lining operation earlier in the year. But at any rate, we decided to go for it because there was a wildfire in the district just just a few miles away. Uh, and, and the folks on the wildfire said, hey, this is actually burning really well. This is great. You know, we're getting good fire effects on this wildfire. So we said, well, that's cool. So we'll go jump over here and try to knock out this burn unit since we have the similar conditions. But um, but but it was just a different place. And uh, and we needed we needed a drier site, um, so I think I think for us if we're burning when the live fuel moistures are really high, um, like John said, you either got to have low humidity, humidity or you're going to have to have um, a dry site. Just just the edaphic conditions are going to have to be more favorable. Um, it's sort of my my take on on summer burning. Uh, we're going to look for those places that are, are that are prone to burning anyway. Yeah, definitely good point, Sam. They're out there. We just gotta go find them. Hey, there are no more questions in the chat. If anyone wants to either type in last minute questions or unmute yourself and ask. Otherwise, you can probably wrap this up, Sean. Okay. I'll give folks a second yep. or two. So, John, I've got a – this is Rob uh, down here in the Smokies. I've, I've just got a quick question for, for you and the group, and it may be maybe more of a rhetorical question uh, for folks to think about. And that's what do, what do we – you know, what do we really mean when we say open or, or early, uh, you know, early? Are we looking just structurally, or we do we also have some expectations of, of composition as well? And I, and I think that's, some, that's another part of the equation that we, you know, we need to keep in mind. Um, because it's not just a structural question. It's there's also compositional, uh, you know, objectives that we all have. So, and I, I, yeah, I don't and know how a, to get to that, but I think this is a great first step to looking at the structural. Uh, yeah, and it's a good caveat. It's a good caveat for what this data set actually is. It is about structure. It is totally blind to composition, and so it. I I, I try and check myself, and I don't always do a good job of. Okay, we've got an early. I should describe this as having an early structure or open structure, but I shouldn't say this is early successional necessarily or open woodland, um, you know, because there there are other desired conditions of early and open like composition, um, you know, that that I don't know anything about according to the, with this data set. So it's a great question, and um, yeah, so that's just my 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 initial response to that. Great, yeah. That just probably just points to the need to continue to, to, to be looking on the ground as well and kind of double checking these areas. And I know you have a lot of plot data to go to go along with this, so uh, maybe at some point that can be put together and, and the whole story, um, we can look at the, be looking at the whole story. Yeah, but that desired, you know, so we've got what we achieved with the burning, but that desired, you know, what do we want this open woodland to look right. like? Right. And it's, a, you know, it's a range of both structure and composition, as as depends on the site, obviously. But um, I'd love to see that blueprint out there, and um, you know, I'd love to that blueprint to be developed and then applied, you know, as as is appropriate on you know, site X, Y, or Z. Absolutely.
I heard some bleeps and bloops. Anything else? That was just um, that the recording, I'll get it uh, I'll put into a box file. And gotcha. then get the networker next week and on the Southern Blue Ridge page on the Conservation Gateway, that link is in the chat window. Okay. Oops, well, we thanks, everybody, for for uh, for participating and, and listening to us uh, go Time. on. You know, Say what? Got another question. Time. Got another question. Oh, great. Hey, Travis. Do you feel that you don't see any significant change in early and open with additional burns due to fuels being consumed in the first entry? So I'll leave that to the to the on the ground experts. You know, I can tell you what the data says about you know, don't see a lot more early open in subsequent burns. Not always true, but mostly. As to why that happens, I'll open that to the floor. In many cases, I think so. I'll just I'll I'll initiate it. Is um, you know we the the the, bur the return interval is, is you know five to seven years in many cases. I think there's a ample fuel um, build up in that time, especially in areas where we have achieved some mortality the first go around. So y'all tell me if I'm right or not. No, I think that's, you know, again, this is Rob, and I, I would agree with that, that I think the fuels recover probably adequately. You know, where you take out the, you know, where you remove large portions of the canopy, you, you know, you have less uh, productivity, you have less oak litter maybe, so maybe those areas don't burn as well, but they're more open and you tend to get more woody fuels and jackpots that burn a little bit differently but still burn pretty well after that five to seven year, you know, uh, fire-free interval. So I think you're I think you're right and I I don't I'm not sure I could explain that it may be that maybe we're you know we're hitting them hard the first time and then the second time we're we've backed off a little bit uh in how we're approaching the burn I, it it could just be chance as well No no Sean it could be I wonder if the heat load index if you if you um, even pre-burn a brand new unit if you looked at the heat load index as a predictor of of what it, how it, the effects might look after it's burned, and how, you know, do you get everything you're going to get on the first burn? And then, really, it's not a fuel question. It's sort of, well, it is, but it's, uh, it's that heat load index is really driving initially, yeah. and then what happens subsequently. Yeah, I think that's an intriguing thing. Um, you know, if you had, if you had a, a site. A burn unit like the one up here, with lots of acreage with a high heat load index, but unlike this site, with not a lot of canopy gaps, I think you you might you you have the the chance to create or you know the higher probability to create future gaps with your subsequent burns in those high heat load index areas. You know, if your whole unit looked like this this one this orange and red section, then the then then something didn't happen the first time that. It seems like there's fertile ground for making more canopy gaps if you want to do that the second time around. So there's some inherent, which you know, which y'all know instinctively about your sites anyway. But again, with heat load index, it's just a way to quantify it and standardize it. But yeah, looking at site heat load index, how much is in, has high HLI values compared to how much of that high HLI acreage um, does uh, does not have canopy gaps? That could be your, you know, potential canopy gap sites. I wonder too if the if the same prescription is used after a first burn and a second burn and a third burn, if you're introducing fire in the same way to the same site, you know, the 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 areas that would burn that first time burned, and um, you know doing it again in that same pattern under the same conditions with the same prescription, uh, it, 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 it empirically at least makes sense that you wouldn't see anything different if you're burning it the same way. But right. So changing the prescription for subsequent burns, I wonder if that's something you could look at. Good question. What else?
Okay. Well, thanks, y'all. Um, this this has been really useful to me, and it's not the end. Um, it's it's never the end of scientific inquiry. It's always just you know in the middle. So, lots of great uh, ideas I heard that make me want to look at different things. Um, and as always, want to share share the results of that and get feedback from y'all. So if you uh, if you heard anything you agree with or disagree with, you know I'm happy to talk about that um, with anybody. And uh, you know I'm always just trying to reflect the reality that you guys are creating with your burn units. So I hope we kind of achieve the goals of you know showing you the the results of this methodology can be widely applied across a you know a whole forest or, or park. Uh, you know, to show you that the, there's a great deal of variability in terms of what prescribed burning has achieved, and then starting to make that link between how a site burned and um, this new way to measure, you know, how a site burned and the tactics that were used on the day of. Y'all do this in AARs all the time, but um, if you you or your burn program ever want to kind of sit down and do this systematically, you know, with 10 burns and go through each one and look at the canopy gaps and look at how it was burned, happy to help um, talk about how to make that happen. And if you're in the GW, Jeff, then I'll happy to be a part of that, or I'm sure our whole team would be. But uh, we'd love to continue these discussions, so thanks a lot.